Ladies and gentlemen, our webinar is beginning. I'm Steve Love, President and CEO of the Dallas-Fort Worth Hospital Council. We really appreciate you participating today in this very educational webinar. It's hosted in coordination with Keystone Healthcare Partners, and they have been very supportive of the Hospital Council and are an associate member of the Council. Today's topic is Imagineering the ED Patient Experience with Telehealth. The speakers from Keystone are going to detail innovative telehealth usage in emergency care with an overall emphasis on leadership, metrics, management, and solutions. This is a very important topic today, as we all know, with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We're delighted that we have with us today Melissa King and Dr. Elizabeth James. Melissa King received her doctorate of nursing practice from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. She is dual boarded and certified in family and emergency nurse practitioner work with over 20 years of experience in emergency care across the nation and has had involvement in several disaster responses in the states of Mississippi, Louisiana, and Florida. She currently serves as the Vice President of Telehealth, Patient Access, and Connected Care for Keystone Health Partners. Our second speaker is Dr. Elizabeth James. She completed her medical training at the University of Louisville School of Medicine in Kentucky. She completed her residency in emergency medicine at Louisiana State University. Dr. James has worked for Keystone since 2010 and has been promoted to the Director of Emergency Medicine and Telehealth Strategic Solutions after she served many years as Regional Medical Director. Dr. James provides clinical direction to all emergency department physicians, works with client hospitals to improve key performance metrics, and oversees Keystone's telehealth operations. This is going to be a very excellent presentation. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa King. for this opportunity to present information regarding telehealth. I know it is a definite passion for both Dr. James and myself, and we are so excited for this opportunity. Um, just for transparency purposes, I am actually located in New Orleans, and we are preparing for yet another hurricane. So if anything changes or you start having difficulties from the technology perspective, please interrupt me, and we have a backup plan for Dr. James to kind of take over the slides at that point. But don't hesitate to interrupt me if there's any issues. So as for the agenda, we are excited to present our experiences and information to the group. We hope the information about the telehealth has been in the past and what it will be in the future post-pandemic or in our post-COVID world is useful and beneficial to this group. And we will also provide information on what telehealth experience looks like and hopefully have time for questions at the end. So with that, we will get started with the past, present, and future of telehealth. To begin, there's a misconception that telehealth has evolved and only been in practice over the past decade, when in reality, telehealth and telemedicine actually started in the late 1950s and early 60s with a specific NASA project and a hospital in Nebraska with bringing in psychiatric um, specialists into a hospital for consultations and inpatient rounding. Then it moved into the prisons in the 1970s, with the largest utilization being EKG interpretation by cardiology that they received via fax. And we all know that we've come a long way since receiving fax. Machines, they're kind of obsolete these days. So moving into the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, utilization focused mainly on specialty care, such as stroke and cardiology. 
And that was because there was a shortage of specialty providers in rural areas. So it was mainly focused on bringing specialty care to rural places. The other specialty that began adoption of this technology in healthcare was actually emergency medicine. This adoption and implementation were not only because emergency medicine was a new specialty, but also because rural hospitals or critical access hospitals couldn't afford board certified emergency medicine physicians and keep their doors open. However, if you drill down into the details, there were NPs in these smaller communities at a lesser cost, and these NPs had a connection with their communities and were willing to stay in these communities so that those communities did have access to high quality emergency care. The evidence also indicated that MPs could handle about 85 to 88% of patients presenting to an emergency department in rural areas. But it was that 12 to 15% that required advanced decision making and additional training in order to provide the appropriate care and meet that standard of care practice. So curriculum was developed, training was started, and technology was placed into rural hospitals linking NPs and rural emergency departments to board certified emergency medicine providers at academic medical centers, leading to improved access and care, allowing these critical access hospitals to remain open. However, barriers still existed in this time frame. And as you can see, a lot of those dealt with being fragmented um, and siloed across specialties. But I want you to pay attention to the last bullet point that put on here of the lack of leadership and organizational commitment to develop a strategy to integrate telehealth into their care delivery program. Um, also lack of reimbursement. Everybody knows they need to get paid for what they do. Um, and it's hard to maintain doors open if you don't have the payment that is there. So moving forward to the 2010-2018 era that we will, for, this, for purposes of this presentation, refer to as pre-COVID. Adoption and utilization of virtual care began to increase. Direct consumer platforms were initiated, mainly because we were in a perfect storm of having a generation that was tech savvy. They wanted instant gratification and those desires and that knowledge was not did not leave out healthcare. The healthcare arena was involved in that. However, you can see on this diagram that bar barriers were still present and especially telehealth really started growing during this time. Personally, I've been in the business for almost two decades now and I've seen the pendulum swing um, between the historical needs for telehealth. We have a broken healthcare system in need of reform and telehealth truly has a way and will continue to transform healthcare as we know it. So 2010 to 2017, what exactly did telehealth look like? This graph specifically shows telehealth utilization in hospitals. You can see the significant increase from 2010 to 2017. Actually, 35 to 70% of hospitals had implemented some form of telehealth, again, with the largest specialty being stroke followed by cardiology at this time. The next bars actually show the remote patient monitoring and when that came into play. And that was mainly from 2015 to 2017, which had an increase in utilization from 43 to 61%. For those of the, you that are unclear of what exactly remote patient monitoring is, um, just a quick definition for CMS for reimbursement purposes is it is the remote physiologic monitoring treatment services needing clinical staff, physician, or other qualified healthcare providers time in a calendar month requiring interactive communication with patients. So I guess the main question here is, so what happened during that era and made this model of care, of virtual care, come into play and get adopted so quickly, especially over a three-year period when we've been looking at it being telehealth being in play since the 1950s? And really, the answer boils down to legislation was in, introduced during this time, and it passed in several states mandating reimbursement for these services to keep patients healthy and actually out of the hospital. So, again, staying in the realm of the early 2000s, this graph demonstrates telehealth utilization differences between rural and urban communities based on insurance claims that were filed. So just notice the increased utilization in urban cities. And this is because the lack of access to providers in specialty areas were also present in urban regions. So it wasn't, they were realizing, hey, um, it's not just rural areas that need specialty care and have a shortage of providers. We also need it in the urban areas. 
And at times, legislation, rules, and regulations have unintended consequences, and this was definitely the case with initial laws and regulations for telehealth. If you think back um, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, these laws and regulations had strict definitions and guidelines regarding rurality, leading to geographical barriers and limited access to specialty care for patients, simply based on what their zip code was and where they lived. So during this time frame, CMS rules and regs changed to include telehealth reimbursement for not only rural communities that were designated as rural, but also included those that were designated as a healthcare provider shortage area. What does a telehealthcare consumer look like? And that has many different forms, and we'll dive deeper into this in a little bit in the um, presentation. But actually, if you note, based on this survey that was done by American Well, 64 million Americans indicated they would switch their primary care providers to the ones who offer telehealth or a virtual option for them. And again, this is all pre-COVID. So this was indicating a market shift even pre-COVID in consent, consumer receptivity and a, to adopt different types of healthcare to include technology solutions. So just a deeper dive into what a telehealth care consumer looks like today, we automatically correlate the use of telehealth being more readily adopted with the younger generation. And it's true, we also have found that all age groups choose this virtual care for different reasons. So it's important to understand the psychographic landscape of these different age populations as not only did their willingness to adopt telehealth vary by age, but so did to their motivation to this adoption of telehealth. So this is important to evaluate as organizations begin to develop their strategy for telehealth implementation. Looking at this graph, it shows a visual of your willingness by age group to adopt telehealth as an option for care. So I want you to Say, pay close attention to the age group of 65 and older. And the only reason I say that is because we automatically assume if you're 65 and older, you're going to be less likely. You want to go and you want to go face to face. And a lot of that is still true. Was pre-COVID probably will revert back a little bit after COVID. But this actually shows that 52% of those 65 and older are actually somewhat willing or very willing to use a telehealth option and try it out. So being pre-COVID, this is a big number and that we anticipate that it will either remain the same or maybe even increase. Um, the jury is still kind of out on that. So this data actually reflects the willingness to use telehealth technology by age demographic. Intuitively makes sense and generally shows younger populations were more receptive to change pre-COVID. Again, this is in relation to the tech savvy generation, the desire for instant gratification, and the thought of the need to do more with less. But on this one specifically, I wanted to do a deeper dive into these age groups and point out the key takeaways that we as industry leaders need to understand as it relates to the catering of these different populations. So we'll discuss a few of these in detail, and I wanna go backwards and start again with the older population of 65 and older, and then we'll work our way backwards. So from the 65 plus category, ensuring that telehealth is part of their health plan is very key for them. As they look to a time that they are retired or looking too retired and worried about finances, they wanna make sure that the insurance they have, whether that's their primary, secondary, you know, Medicare, whatever they have, it is included as an option. And working with PCPs across organizations to make sure that telehealth is an option would be key to maintain this market share of this age population. Um, they also see this, which is very big, as an alternative to the use of urgent care in emergency departments, again, trying to stay well. And if you think through what we've been through in the COVID pandemic, we, were we still needed that access to care, trying to bring the care to the patients and keep them out of the hospitals to keep them safe as well as keep the providers safe. Another important aspect were the prescription um, renewals via telehealth. And I say that with caution because there's so many different state laws, um, rules, and regulations that you have to be sure that you're on top of um, for your providers to do this practice and do it safely. 
All right, so we'll move into the 44 to 64 age group. Again, insurance plans are important, working with primary care providers to make sure that's an option for this age group. But most importantly in this age group, we start emphasizing the convenience and time savings as a rationale for utilization. Um, prescriptions, again, important to this group. Um, moving a little bit more backwards, 35 to 43. Um, explaining more and going more in depth about the telehealth insurance coverage for the telehealth use is usually important to this group, emphasizing ease, convenience, and time savings. I'm super excited to hear Dr. James um, explain how she gives these examples of this in her presentation of true examples of this age group needing that time saving to be able to take care of kids and so forth. So super excited about what she has to share with this group. And then of course the 18 to 33, 34 age group, telehealth um, focusing on some more behavioral health emphasis is kind of key to this group. Um, not that it's not a, important across the board. However, in this age group, if you think about your college and your early 20s and having that access to any kind of behavioral health offering is very important to this group at a reduced cost. So back to the past, present, and future of telehealth, and we move into the year that I don't think any of us will ever forget, 2020. And although this has been a very trying year globally, if there is a silver lining in COVID and the public health um, epidemic, it is that it has propelled telehealth adoption and utilization forward by about five to 10 years, I would say. Healthcare and consumers of healthcare have not suffered due to the lack of access as much as we thought it would have, which is always positive news and I think has actually increased the willingness for adoption. And not only is the technology available at an affordable rate, but the current administration and regulatory agencies have worked together and provided many waivers and relaxed rules and regulations to the point it's made it even easier to adopt and implement um, different telehealth options in different sectors. These relaxed regulations have allowed for reimbursement in series scenarios that were not previously available. So exactly what changes and what impacts do they have for 2020? That's always a big question. And so if you take, if you look at the key changes, 18 states changed their telemedicine law or actually created new ones. Many states have allowed providers to virtually treat patients in other states. And the DEA actually came out with a statement and clarified that providers are in fact allowed to use telemedicine to prescribe controlled substances. Again, anything with prescription, um, especially when it comes to controlled substances, I'd like to stress the significance of knowing your laws and regulations within your state. Um, also understanding that um, narcotics are usually not, are very, um, it's not standard of care to do that, especially in the middle of an opioid epidemic. Um, however, the DEA has stated that they do understand there are reasons um, to be sure people can get their medicines, and so they want to be sure to take care of the patients that they have. I just stress the importance of making sure that you understand your state law. Um, the impact of this is that 50 to 70 times the number of telehealth visits pre-COVID-19, and there's been a 50% of providers that view it as being more positive than they did before COVID. And 64% of providers said they are now actually more comfortable utilizing it. And it's almost like mainstay and a part of their practice. So there's no doubt if you look at COVID as a whole in 2020, compressed advancement in the era of telehealth that would have otherwise taken years, due in part to regulatory changes that needed to occur. So deeper dive into telehealth in 2020 and what that looks like. So Medicare fee-for-service in-person visits for primary care fell precipitously mid-March at the beginning of COVID and began to rise again mid-April and May. In this graph, you can see a part of the near convergence between in-person and telehealth visits. Actually, nearly half, 43.5% of Medicare primary visits were provided via telehealth in April compared to less than 1% pre-COVID. And then this graph differentiates rural and urban. So the disparity between urban and rural visits is indicative of the nature of the public health emergency as populations not previously considered to be a priority for telehealth offerings are now poised to have the greatest benefit. Again, think back to what I was talking about with the 65 and older being willing, even pre-COVID, then hitting them with a pandemic and fear of going to 
a provider or an urgent care or an emergency department and having this option. So that's kind of the rationale behind that. Um, but telehealth can truly bridge the gap and eliminate geographical barriers to access to the high quality care and truly bring healthcare to the patient instead of always focusing on taking the patient to healthcare. So back to 2020 and where do we go after 2020? What does the future look like for telehealth in a post-COVID era? And how does that not only translate to the future of healthcare, but also the future of hospitals, hospital systems, and even companies such as ours, Keystone Healthcare Partners? And some of this is left to the future to tell us, but it is clear those not investing in telehealth and innovation will be left behind in the new era of healthcare. So I'll now turn the presentation over to Dr. James, who I have the pleasure of working with daily. She has great insight into the future of not only emergency medicine and telehealth solution, but healthcare in general. She'll give more clarity to what the patient experience looks like in this paradigm shift of healthcare. Thanks, Melissa. Okay. 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 So I am actually in Austin, Texas, so we should not have any um, hurricane technical difficulties here. Um, so I am um, really grateful to present to you as well today. Melissa walked us through such a fascinating history of what most of us perceive as a relatively new way of implementing healthcare uh, via telemedicine. But her section really illustrated how slow healthcare has been over the many decades um, since when it started to adapt technology to support our goals. When faced with a challenging pandemic and changing laws, we all adapted very quickly, especially the patients. And that leads us to planning for the future of healthcare um, using telemedicine. So my purpose as an emergency department medical director is to help our hospital clients apply technology in a way that augments existing processes to meet their specific unique needs. Over the years, I've worked with administrators within almost every type of hospital setting and system I'm fortunate enough to work creatively at Keystone with our telehealth team of pioneer clinicians like Melissa, business colleagues, and our technical partners. Together, we've imagined and engineered patient flow. We serve to optimize the client's uh, return on investment and streamline clinical functionality to provide patient experiences unlike any others out there. That is why the title of my section is a nod to Walt Disney. We know that what we've imagineered with Keystone is pretty magical. Our telehealth program is scalable to any size and adaptable enough to meet almost every scenario you would need to tackle now or in the future. And on behalf of our Keystone team, I couldn't be prouder to share this with you in the hopes that some of these ideas can resonate in ways that will transform healthcare for the better. It's been a long year and we all deserve something easier. While our concepts have been based on careful analysis and metrics by our team, for purposes of this presentation, we'll not be disclosing any proprietary information out of respect for our partner hospitals. So this is our basic emergency medicine patient flow chart. We developed this visual to showcase our broad perspective and illustrate that we've accounted for many future options when our hospitals are ready. We won't necessarily go into detail on all aspects of the telemedicine programs we've developed. However, that broad coverage of the vision will, is going to help me convey best to you the direction emergency medicine is taking due to technology advancements and policy changes that Melissa mentioned. So on the left, you'll see a picture of a sick patient with urgent or emergency care needs that wants healthcare access. Uh, the next column over of icons depicts how that patient can choose to access the system of their choice. This is important to note because this column is really in a pre-hospital setting. And traditionally, most hospitals haven't been too focused on pre-hospital care and connecting with patients at that time. The brick and mortar hospital experience is depicted by two icons in the right upper quadrant of the screen labeled emergency department and inpatient and discharge is depicted by the picture in the bottom right quadrant of the screen. The big yellow diamonds represent technology changes that overlay on top of this patient flow. These diamonds represent our ability to improve flow across hospitals, streamline our resources, and conserve and share costs. We use technology to provide the patient provider and admin teams the experience and results we've always strived for. 
please note the important arrow that connects our discharge patients back to the system because that's a big piece of the magic that we'll go into in a bit. So now that you're oriented to the chart, we're gonna go back to the patient that wants healthcare access and discuss how we support them. Our first diamond represents a direct-to-consumer platform that is aimed at providing a seamless transition from a patient's home into the emergency department. We call our direct-to-consumer option ED to home. Let's envision a single mom at home who is having some mild chest pain at night, but she can't imagine her, ch she can't really manage those children in an ED, and she isn't really sure she needs to call her neighbor for hours of babysitting help. It looks like her Google search shows this may just be reflux anyway. Taking an aspirin and a Tums and waiting until the morning when her children are at school may be the best logistical option for this tired mom. But what if she had access to your ED providers and could be seen by a physician in your ED who would ask her all the right questions and teach her why their recommendation of coming to the emergency department is the right choice? Along with external research and our own findings, we believe a significant portion of healthcare consumers have inappropriately held off on emergency care in the past. Patients want to speak with a provider and they want the comfort of knowing that coming to the ED is appropriate. They also want to know why so that they can make their own decisions. Uh, these patients, as we know, are referred to in the industry as consumers, not patients. They play and a very active role in how they go about accessing healthcare for their own needs. I can say that within our own ED to home programs, we have so far seen that somewhere between 50 and 80% of all ED to home patients are actually referred to the emergency department and they do follow the instructions by, by coming for further care. There's really um, a much smaller percentage that actually have an issue that is able to be diagnosed and discharged virtually. Prior to these types of programs, so many patients would call the ED asking the same questions. The standard response from the nurse or clerk was typically, I'm so sorry, we can't give you medical advice over the phone, but please come in to see us. Now our nurses can direct them to the ED to home phone number or website that we co-develop with our hospital's IT program. Continued ongoing marketing within the community will boost volume and provide opportunities that patients haven't previously had. This is a paradigm shift for them too. A direct-to-consumer telemedicine program should be designed to empower your patients, and the virtual provider is trained to teach and educate those patients so they have the power to make valid healthcare decisions. Our intention at Keystone is to provide seamless patient flow experience from their home to the ED. They just happen to be triaged, seen, and examined by a provider at home and recommended for in-person emergency care with a brick-and-mortar clinician. The chart and registration process would have actually been completed for them and there is no additional charge as they transition from home to hospital as long as they arrive within an established time frame. They don't have to re-register upon arrival and their record is already on file and active. This is a type of workflow that can really elevate that patient experience. Patients prefer direct-to-consumer programs offered locally above the larger national competitors when they have the option of being seen in person and being evaluated for complaints that are perhaps a little more compute, uh, acute than those other direct-to-consumer programs. So back to the overview chart. Our telehealth team firmly believes the future of emergency care resides within the broader field of community paramedicine, specifically the mobile urgent care and tele-EMS sectors. Some of you may be ET3 recipients or have knowledge of this CMS program. For those that don't know about ET3, let me briefly summarize the intent of the program. This is very important to grasp the paradigm shift we will see in emergency medicine in the upcoming decade. This concept illustrates why hospitals that prepare their telehealth program with this in mind will have more advantages going forward. Medicare regulations have historically only allowed payment for emergency ground ambulance services when individuals are transported to hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, and dialysis centers. Most beneficiaries who call 911 with a medical emergency are therefore transported to one of those facilities, and most often to a hospital ED, even when the lower acuity de destination may more appropriately meet an individual's needs. Emergency Triage, Treat, and Transport, or ET3, is a voluntary five-year payment model that will provide greater flexibility to ambulance care trains to address emergency health care needs in Medicare fee-for-service beneficiaries following a 911 call. 
Under the ET3 model, CMS will pay participating ambulance su suppliers and providers to, number one, transport an individual to a hospital emergency department or other destination covered under the regulations. Number two, transport to an alternative destination partner, such as a primary care doctor's office or an urgent care clinic. Or number three, provide treatment in place with a qualified healthcare partner, either on the scene or connected using telehealth. ET3 aims to improve quality and lower costs by reducing avoidable transport to the ED and unnecessary hospitalizations following those transports. We created our platform to allow your virtual ED providers to connect on demand with local EMS or mobile urgent care providers. This program is aimed at using technology to triage, treat, and transport patients to the ED or to an alternate destination of care somewhere within your hospital system. For far too long, our emergency departments have remained less than ideally connected to our paramedic colleagues out in the field. CMS has recently indicated that they will move on providing the grant funds for the EMS agencies that applied over 18 months ago in January 2021. So this is sure to be an area of hyper advancement over the next several years. We're now gonna pivot to the, from a pre-hospital experience in emergency medicine to the patient's experiences at the hospital. And this is what we're most excited about presenting today. We've coined the sum of these virtual experiences throughout the hospital stay as Keystone Optimum. Keystone Optimum is comprised of three programs. Virtual ED teletriage is the first Optimum program. We're gonna take a deep dive into ED virtual teletriage in the next few slides, so hang on uh, for a little bit more inf robust information. Virtual case management and utilization review is the second Optimum program. This option allows ED providers real-time access to virtual case managers. Case managers assist ED providers with their inpatient admissions and ensure documentation and admission status is appropriate at the time of admission from the ED. In the past, our smaller client hospitals weren't able to provide ED case management to their ED clinicians, mostly for financial reasons. They simply didn't have the volume to justify another full-time employee. But in a virtual world, that option is scalable and can be achieved for all hospitals, no matter their ED volume or admission rate. This program ensures our hospital clients appropriately bill and code for the ho hospitalizations from the very beginning admission decision in the ED. And I know our um, administrators and CFOs are thrilled about that. Virtual inpatient hospital rounding is the third optimum program. This allows hospitals flexibility to manage multiple inpatient scenarios and could accommodate a variety of staffing patterns to reduce costs and save time. So the question is, how do we accomplish all of these initiatives we've discussed up until now using one program that aligns with your existing EMR and is easy to learn, affordable, and provide us with the ability to scale up or down or allow for multiple hospitals to share these virtual human resources and conserve costs? The advanced software queuing technology used by Keystone will allow for patients, brick and mortar, ED providers, hospitalists, paramedics, case managers, and nursing staff to easily connect with the right virtual providers at the right time. Last, we're gonna talk about a patient's discharge. When we talk about discharge for our Keystone telemedicine programs, we are talking about discharge across the system. So that includes our ED to home programs, our tele-EMS programs, our EDs and our hospital programs. By adding, adding artificial technology to the discharge process, we reconnect with our patients so that they are able to re-engage with the system easily in the future. We call these combined processes of monitoring satisfaction post-discharge and providing patients a way to reaccess the system for post-discharge questions or virtual visits, Keystone Connect. And we're gonna take a deep dive into Keystone Connect to show you exactly what we mean and why it's important. But as promised, we're gonna uh, switch to Keystone Optimum's tele-triage option. Many larger hospitals already have providers in triage. I hope in this next section to show you those of you with brick and mortar providers in triage, why virtual triage providers may be more optimal. For those hospitals without a provider in ED triage, and especially for any hospital with single coverage providers, you probably innately understand the waste of time your patients and staff experience. That's why you've spent the last decade discussing metrics and solutions with your ED directors and nurse managers, LWATs, door to triage times, door to doc times, turnaround times, patient satisfaction, it goes on. 
your patients register, then they wait to be triaged by a nurse, then they wait in a waiting room, then they wait for the physician, then they wait for orders to be entered, and they wait for those orders to be executed, they wait for the physician to receive and re review the orders, and then they wait again for them to have time to explain the discharge. This is obviously a very unlean process in which everyone experiences the pain of your system's bottleneck and limitations. And it's extremely frustrating for providers, nurses, patients, and your admin team. You need a solution. Teletriage is the concept of using a virtual provider, either a physician or an advanced practice provider, experienced and skilled in emergency triage and trained in the art of telemedicine and website manner. When executed properly, teletriage dramatically impacts patients leaving without treatment. It also drastically improves flow, satisfaction, safety, and increases your capacity. These virtual providers are available on demand when the patient and nurse are ready for triage. Specialized queuing software allows them to appear virtually on a screen after the nurse requests a triage consult. A good virtual triage provider on average spends about 90 seconds interacting with the patient and placing orders in the EMR. These providers can work within one hospital or even in multiple hospitals for the purpose of rapidly triaging ED patients and sharing costs. They can triage between nine and 12 patients per hour on average and even up to 20. One virtual provider can triage for an annual hospital ED volume of between 120 and 140,000 visits annually. That doesn't mean you need to have that many annual visits to justify teletriage. If you only have a hospital that sees 40,000 visits annually, it simply means your virtual teletriage provider could be shared with other facilities and you would benefit in cost savings because your costs would align with your shared portion of the total annual visits the provider can see. Both clinicians and patients have high satisfaction ratings with these experiences. <clears throat> it's easy to use and implement, and you don't need fancy hardware, just a forward-facing tablet. You also really need a good triage nurse, an additional room or area that they can go to so that a triage tech can expedite the, the orders immediately following the triage. Virtual teletriage providers have fewer distractions than they do in a busy hospital. They aren't interrupted, they can focus on one patient at a time, and they can triage faster than their brick-and-mortar counterparts. Ordering patterns of teletriage physicians as compared to a physical physician in the ED have been studied and a high rate of concordance has been found. Additionally, teletriage offers protection from risk of infection, particularly important to the pandemic, and it saves PPE. <clears throat> Last but not least, it allows you to scale to your own hospital's needs and conserve cost of labor. So the next three slides, further support how virtual teletriage offers you value and significant returns on your investment using LWAT, bed capacity, and risk reduction. In this slide, we are using a hypothetical ED system with 120,000 combined annual ED visits. This slide shows the financial benefits reducing LWATs would have on the hospital's technical revenue from the ED. Let's hypothesize that system-wide, there was a 4% LWAT rate in the system. Now, let's reduce those LWATs from 4% to 1% using virtual teletriage to recapture those patients who left previously. In that scenario, there would be 3,600 patients who left prior to treatment. If the ED technical revenue, the amount that you generate on your side, amounts to $250 per patient, the total system ED technical revenue gained would amount to $900,000, which is quite significant. In the next slide, we're gonna take that further. Now, we are going to apply a 25% admission rate to those 3,600 patients who would leave normally, but are now staying because of the rapid teletriage virtual provider uh, offers and previous studies that indicate LWAT in certain systems can average out to be an ESI of around level three. Um, I think that's a big misconception. Um, a lot of people think that LWAT, even administrators and providers think that LWAT are very low acuity type patients, and that's true to a certain extent, but retrospective studies have actually shown that um, it, 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 it's it, at an average of ESI level three, um, that I think that it's a lot higher. Um, those patients can be um, much higher in terms of um, 
their acuity level. So let's just go with that. And if we say your average net inpatient revenue per patient is $7,000 per patient, then we could extrapolate that the incremental inpatient revenue post-improvement process plan would total $6.3 million. So ED technical revenue from the last slide at $900,000 plus the uh, $6.3 million um, on the incremental inpatient revenue would total $7.2 million. I mean, obviously, each hospital's numbers are different, but the point here is that you should plug in your own numbers and do all you can to minimize LWAPs within your hospital. Adding a virtual teletriage provider would be our suggestion to accomplish those goals and achieve significant return on investment in the process. So this slide illustrates um, the significance of time save. So if not many time, right? Time is many. If a 20 minute length of stay reduction was applied to 120,000 ED visits, an additional 40,000 hours of annual ED capacity would be generated. Time is money for your hospital system. 40,000 hours is a lot of extra capacity and manpower. While you may have a much smaller annual ED volume, the money and time for hospitals struggling to reduce LWATs will be uh, very significant. And finally, on patient safety and risk, we know that as time to see a provider increases, the risk of malpractice claims due to. Virtual teletriage will land your door to doc time in this category and will reduce risk and improve patient safety. Now we're gonna to pivot towards Keystone Connect, which uses advanced artificial intelligence or AI to provide data to administrative teams and link the patient back to the system. After a healthcare encounter, discharge lists are uploaded with very important patient demographics tied to them. 72 hours post-discharge, patients will receive a text message survey. This is an example of the text they will receive. Their answers will determine the next question asked. Think of it as an HCAP survey in real time via text message, but with the added ability to intervene and change any negative comments immediately. If a patient was not satisfied, we would have the ability to offer them an appointment. This could be by phone or by one of our nurse liaisons, as in, in this example. The patient could choose from a variety of available times and they'd be able to discuss their concerns at that time. Perhaps they didn't understand their discharge instructions and we could help them. Interventions at this point would be dependent on what the hospital wanted, but we would have the ability to schedule telemedicine visits too. And the icing on the cake for me, those positive reviews, we can now integrate them to your social media platforms, Google reviews, et cetera, to bring you from two stars to four stars. But pro and, and this also is very exciting for me as a medical director because I have data now that I've never had access to quite as easily before. This is an example of a Keystone Connect report. Over 110,000 visits have been logged by our partner at various EDs across the nation. And what's important to note is that we can stratify collected data based on provider scores, facility, even based on the patient's gender or zip code. The artificial intelligence can provide such granular information to produce real changes in satisfaction. For instance, one hospital realized that they had poor satisfaction in women that were between the ages of 20 to 30 with abdominal complaints. The Connect report indicated this could be due to placement of these patients in non-private rooms or rooms not equipped with the ability to assess their GYN needs in that age category. The hospital changed some of their policies and how they place patients in rooms. And over the next month, as the satisfaction within that category of patients improved on their Keystone Connect report, they understood that the change was effective on patient satisfaction in a positive way. That is the future of healthcare and a patient-centered approach supported by technology. In conclusion, we've really only scraped the surface of the ways we can optimize staff, metrics, and add benefits using telehealth. It really is a bright future for all of us, despite all the challenges we faced in 2020. Thank you so much for your attention and, and time, and we'll turn to questions now. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation by both of you. We do have some questions, and Melissa, I may be wrong, but I think this question is probably best directed to you. We all know federal and state laws do not mirror each other. Can you explain, in your opinion, what's different in Texas than it is in federal laws? What should we be aware of, and how do we secure reimbursement? That's like three questions in one. 
That is. Thanks, Steve. Nothing like jumping into a complex question right off the bat, right? But I think we all, I think I alluded to the importance of the legislative um, mandates as well as the regulatory mandates. So I'll, I'll brief the surface, but I do want to let you know too, I can research more and provide a link um, to you guys, to you or Chris. And if you want to distribute the link that actually goes into more depth of what the differences is in the states, especially Texas, um, then I'm happy to do that after this webinar. Um, right. So I think I think the most important thing to remember is that there are statutory requirements and then there's regulatory requirements that have to be considered when you're practicing telehealth. And keeping up with those changes and to be honest, the actual needs that need to happen for those regulations in your current law are very important. But, but specifically for Texas. Okay, y'all have Senate Bill 1107 that amended Kate, Texas state law definition of telemedicine to mean a something different than what telehealth means. So it actually says that telemedicine services is um, a healthcare service delivered by a physician licensed in the state or a health professional acting under delegation and supervision of a physician licensed in the state and acting within the scope of the physicians or the health professionals licensed to a patient at a different physical location. So what that means is you have the provider has to be licensed in the state. It's not where the provider is actually, it's where the patient is. So always remember the license is connected to provide the care where the patient is located. And this amendment actually represents an expansion of what the term in Texas actually used to, used to mean. Um, let's see, so Texas used to have the statutory definition that telemedicine had to be initiated by a physician and it had to require the use of quote advanced tech telecommunication technology, which is, you know, confusing. And we all know that as we were talking earlier, there are some things that advanced practice providers, nurse practitioners, um, PAs, other, you know, physical therapists, speech therapists, everybody who has a license to practice medicine has some form of telehealth they can use. So this Senate Bill 1107 actually expanded the practice in Texas of telemedicine to include additional health care providers, but it also says that the term telehealth and telemedicine are mutually exclusive. So whereas a lot of states and the federal kind of use those words interchangeably, Texas is very specific on what telemedicine medical services are versus what telehealth services are. So when that when Senate Bill 1107 was enacted, Texas imposed on physicians and patients relatively stringent uh, physical encounter requirements on telemedicine visit, and this bill shifted the paradigm, removing express statutory authorization for the Texas Medical Board. So now we're moving into the regulatory agency. So you have a law in your state, and then that law gives your regulatory agencies the way to um, interpret that law and actually develop the rules and regulations. So if you go to your Texas Medical Board um, website, it requires a face-to-face -face consultation between um, and a relationship, but the initial one does not any longer have to be face-to-face -face in order to say that you have a patient-provider relationship. So in short, though, Texas on, and their medical board side has not actually done a deep dive into those rules, and so there is no express legal or regulatory requirement that requires that face-to-face -face or in-person examination of a patient in connection with a telemedicine service exam. So I know that's a lot of information on that. So that's kind of what the difference is between what your law is, that Senate bill that was enacted, and then how that goes down into your regulatory agencies. So again, you do have to still have your consent to treat. That's kind of mainstay now across all, not just federal, but each state says that you need a consent to treat. Um, and then specifically January 1st of this year, um, we'll shift a little bit into the reimbursement question. I think I remember, can you, I think the last part of that question was how do we make sure we get paid or that we're complying with everything to make sure our reimbursement stays in place, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay. So effective this year in January, um, the state regulated health benefit plans must provide coverage for healthcare service that are done virtually 
if they provide that option to their plan members. So if a health insurer has a telehealth option for their um, beneficiaries, then they also now, according to state law, have to pay for virtual visits across the board. So they can't say, okay, we're only going to pay for the ones that are included in our insurance plan. Like if there's any kind of, there's contractual things that you go through with insurances, but it does have to be paid now and it doesn't have to be the same as face-to-face. -face. So if you look at a difference, say, between Mississippi and Texas and the parity laws, Mississippi actually mandates you have to do it the same as face-to-face. -face. Texas has not get drilled down and made it that specific, but they do have to pay for the service itself. And then we know that Medicare also requires the services to be provided, but it has um, some stipulations about where the provider is located, where the patient is located, and all of that for um, reimbursement. And so as you can see, it's very complex, and there's a lot of information that goes into this. And um, we've stated before that the silver lining of COVID is the laxity of some of these regulations. And we do anticipate that some of these regulations um, and state law will stay the way they are currently, but it is important to seek counsel. I'll just say that to make sure that the way that you're delivering this method of virtual care actually meets not just federal, but state um, and regulatory agency mandates. I know that's a lot of information, but like I said, I'm happy to provide the state-specific Texas web link to um, you guys so that you can distribute it to the participants. Thank, thank you. Our next question, I think Dr. James really referenced you. It, you mentioned the value proposition from a malpractice perspective. Have you seen or experienced any negative repercussions from a legal perspective? Okay. So, I mean, to answer that simply, um, no. Um, we at Keystone haven't experienced any litigation with regards to the telemedicine um, practices that we've established. And I think that's, that's really across the board. My colleagues um, in, you know, other professional organizations, um, the American College of Emergency Physicians, they're kind of reporting the same thing. There's not a lot of gate, little, there's not a lot of litigate known litigation in these areas um and we and, you know and we know that telemedicine when used appropriately is a common tool in risk management departments because just for that fact it, it mitigates risk for patients and um, and in terms of like teletriage because we talked about that um at, at length today um there there have been no cases of malpractice several studies you know, as we talked about, have shown that ordering patterns of the teletriage provider are really no different in any statistical sense than somebody, you know, an in-person provider. And um, the teletriager is more focused in a remote setting with fewer distractions, so that makes sense. Um, and we also know that, uh, and showed on that one slide, that um, reducing the door-to-dot -door times um, or door-to-provider -door times reduces malpractice risk. Um, and that's really what pellet triage does well so um but you know to be transparent do what we think it will come i mean of course but we don't know what that really looks like um but so far we can say telemedicine is decreasing risk not adding to it and i hope that answers that it does question we've got yeah we've got two more questions in the queue how do you adjust your approach to leveraging telehealth technologies across a diverse hospital portfolio. One size can't fit all. Uh, Dr. James, you want me to take a stab at that one um, first and then you can yeah, piggyback sure. or follow up? Okay. Absolutely. Right. So let me make sure I understood. So not having a diverse hospital portfolio and making sure that your telemedicine, is, is it a one size fits all and what does that look like? I think is what I heard. So that's actually a really yeah. good question. Um, and so, again, simple answer is no. Telehealth is definitely not a one size fits all per se, but it's viewed as a way to bridge gaps in access to care or providers that you're experiencing at your level. 
One of the absolutely amazing aspects of working with an organization such as Keystone is we have the ability and flexibility to work closely with our clients to make sure we're offering a solution that works for them. We're not giving you something and saying, make it work in your system. We're actually having those call touches to be able to do deep dives into your metrics and say, how can we fill the gaps? What are your pain points? How can we make this better for you? And use technology to make us more efficient and bridge those gaps and the pain points that we're having. Um, so what one hospital may find beneficial, the, another one may not. So I hope that kind of answers um, broadly the one size fits all. Dr. James, do you have additional stuff to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I guess I could provide an example on that. Um, like, so one of our one of our hospital clients that has several um, satellite uh, locations um, that are actually staffed by nurse practitioners. Um, you know, they want to obviously want to, like everybody else wants to want to use technology to uh, come up with um, a way uh, to, to for physicians to collaborate uh, with those nurse, the nurse practitioners and PAs that are staffing those satellite EDs. And um, we proposed that to use like a, tr a teletriage provider, just like you all saw, but to, for them to make that provider a physician. So in that way, because they were real concerned also about uh, safety and risk management and all those types of things, and um, and and also there's a, a sh it, it, there were there's a you know there has to be a shift. I think that um, for their, they were worried that their communities were so used to seeing physicians in those EDs, how would they respond if an advanced practice provider was in there? So we use technology to help solve all of that. Um, and if you put a physician in the teletriage uh, that can then collaborate with that nurse practitioner, but also see those patients coming in and help to put uh, the initial orders in. Um, so that's 85% of triage are gonna walk in, and then the other remaining 15%, um, the more emergent ones, those are they're gonna collaborate on those anyway. So essentially you've got 100% collaboration by that phys remote physician with all patients in that system. So just, uh, I guess that illustrates that point. How do we solve, uh, you, you can use technology to do anything to solve any client's problem. So um, I hope that helps provide us details. Right, thank y'all. The final question, how long does it take to get a program such as yours at Keystone up and running? Well, Melissa, you want me to take a stab at that? <laughs> yeah, I'll take a stab. So I, yeah, you go ahead. You go ahead. So that, it's an interesting question because clearly it's, that's going to be kind of a variable question as well. Um, if you look at where the contract negotiation and the credentialing of the providers at your facility, I will say at each, each individual facility, you know, that usually takes the longest. So how long does it take a provider to get credentialed. In the meantime, though, in that 90 days, I guess, is usually the typical time frame is what I've kind of experienced in the past. In those 90 days, we can be working simultaneously with getting the IT connectivity done, the platform, the hardware, training on the software, training of the providers, working together to make sure exactly what other initiatives may be beneficial from a telehealth. So I would say strictly based on, if you look at from a credentialing, contractual, legal perspective, that's usually the longest process, taking anywhere from, I guess, 90 to 100 days, because that includes licensing if we need to add um, providers, licenses in additional states. Um, but from a technology perspective alone, uh, taking out those variables, it's pretty quick. I mean, we have the technology and software available, um, and then we can go in and have something set up within a couple of weeks um, to a month time frame. Great. Well, we want to thank uh, Melissa King and Dr. Elizabeth James for an excellent presentation today. We also thank you for the Q&A session. And on behalf of the Hospital Council and all the participants on this webinar, we thank you. And if you have any final words, we certainly turn it over to you and then we can adjourn. Steve, I just appreciate you guys giving us the opportunity to share our experiences um, throughout this webinar. So thank you. You guys have been great to work with and we look forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you very much. And we will now adjourn this webinar. Thank you for participating.